Hello and welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine in which we discuss the cardiovascular system, the pathophysiology of cardiac disease, and your cardiac exam. By the end of this session, you'll be able to trace the path of a red blood cell through the systemic and pulmonary circulation, identify at least eight causes of chest pain, list five signs of severe illness in the patient with chest pain, list at least five steps in both the initial and ongoing care of a patient complaining of chest pain or difficulty breathing with signs of severe illness, perform a cardiovascular examination, and identify the following seven EKG rhythms and describe the treatment of each. And those are sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia and tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, asystole, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. The chest is the upper part of the thoracoabdominal cavity. They were one while you were in the uterus developing as a fetus and then the diaphragm grew across to separate the two. And when you breathe, the diaphragm moves. So abdominal disease can cause chest pain and conversely, chest disease, heart attack, can present with abdominal pain. We're looking at a CAT scan of a patient's chest. The side with the numbers on where it says 32 is the patient's right, the other is the patient's left, the patient's front is superior. And in the center of the chest you're seeing the heart, that's that large structure that's kind of grayish with bright white just to the left of the midline. The dark gray with little white lines in are the lungs. Directly behind the heart you see a circle that's bright white, that's the aorta, and then just behind that are the vertebrae. So a red blood cell enters the heart through the right atrium. It passes into the right ventricle. When the right ventricle squeezes, it pushes it into the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery is deoxygenated blood. The pulmonary artery splits into two and then splits smaller and smaller until eventually you get to the pulmonary capillary beds, which surround the alveoli in the lungs and that's where the gas exchange occurs. So carbon dioxide leaves the bloodstream, oxygen comes into the bloodstream and connects to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. The red blood cell then passes into the pulmonary vein, but it's now oxygenated, into the left atrium, through the left ventricle, and then gets pushed out through the aortic valve into the aorta, at which point it will go somewhere in the body. And that just depends on which artery it passes through. We'll assume that it's going down into your left leg. So it goes through the descending aorta, splits into the femoral, the iliac arteries and the femoral arteries and gets smaller and smaller until it reaches a tissue level capillary bed. So you get arteries, arterioles, and then capillary beds. At that point, most of the plasma leaks out of the blood vessels, but the red blood cell stays in the capillary, passes through the capillary, comes out in the other end in a venial and then that venule returns it to a vein. It comes up through the vena cava and returns again to the right atrium. In any patient with chest pain, you do your usual assessment, control exsanguinating hemorrhage, airway breathing circulation, disability, expose them and protect them from the environment and find clues as to what's going on. It's very important when a patient's complaining of chest pain to differentiate between traumatic versus non-traumatic causes because both the diseases that occur and their treatments vary widely between those two general categories. So make sure you ask that question. And then you perform a focused history and physical exam based on the cause, traumatic versus non-traumatic. If you find any of the following, these are signs of severe disease. Someone who is pale or clammy, that's a problem. If they're confused, disoriented, or even more irritable than usual, that would suggest less blood flow to the heart, that's a problem. Blue lips and fingers, what's called cyanosis, that's a problem. That means that you're not getting good oxygen into the blood. Shortness of breath, wheezes, so the high-pitched musical sounds, crackles, the sound that you make when you rub the hair beside your ear between your fingers, or no air movement at all, a silent chest, are all very concerning findings for a patient with chest pain. So let's talk about things that can cause chest pain and shortness of breath. And we'll start with angina, or angina, depending on how you pronounce it. 
your coronary arteries narrow. They build plaques along the walls. And just like old pipes in a house where they build up calcium deposits on the inside, the water doesn't flow through as well. And if you put too much demand on, you can't supply all the water you need. Well, the same thing happens in the heart. There's blood vessels, the coronary vessels that supply the heart itself narrow down. And normally the trickle that flows through is enough, but then the patient walks or exerts themselves. There's more demand than there is supply, and they get chest pain or discomfort. And if you decrease the oxygen demand, then you'll, your symptoms will go away because the plumbing will be able to meet those needs. So typically when you get your history, the patient reports a prior history of angina or they have diabetes or high blood pressure, something to predispose them to heart disease, and they describe their symptoms as occurring with activity and resolving with rest. What symptoms will they have? Well, typical symptoms are a heaviness or a squeezing in the chest that can go up to the jaw or the arms or back, shortness of breath, sweats, nausea or vomiting. Sometimes they'll describe a feeling of impending doom. That's very common when people aren't getting enough blood flow to their brain. And in women or diabetics, or frankly anyone really, but particularly in those two groups, they may describe their discomfort as being an upper abdominal pain in the epigastric area just below the bottom of what's called the xiphoid process, the, that little thing that sticks off the bottom of your sternum or breastbone. And so those are pretty typical symptoms of angina. Your exam is typically going, typically going to be completely normal. They may be a little bit hypertensive. Their blood pressure may be up just because they're anxious. They may be sweaty. But in my experience, the exam is almost com always completely normal. Treatment, your usual initial stabilization, X, A, B, C, D, E, F. Make them rest. And if this is angina, the symptoms are going to go away. If need be, nitroglycerin. They may take their own. You may assist them. Oxygen, if they're having a lot of symptoms. Morphine, if they're having a lot of pain. Aspirin, if they're having a lot of ongoing symptoms. What do you do with these patients? Well, you're going to talk to medical control. If they have a history of angina, the symptoms are the same as they always get. It just happened that someone grabbed you and said, hey, he's having some chest pain. They resolve after one to two nitroglycerin. Then the patient likely can stay shipboard because this is stable angina or stable angina. If the symptoms are any different than usual, they came on with less exertion, there were more symptoms, the pain was more intense, it took more nitroglycerin or they lasted longer, that's unstable angina and the patient needs to be evacuated. In a heart attack or myocardial infarct, those plaques rupture and they cause a complete blockage of the coronary arteries. So there is no blood flow. And that's the big difference between angina and a heart attack. In, in angina, you still have blood flow. It's just not enough to meet your demand. In a heart attack, you have no blood flow at all. It's a complete blockage. So whereas your symptoms will resolve with rest in angina, they typically won't in a heart attack. They don't resolve until the, either the vessel is opened up again through mechanical or chemical means or the section of heart that's affected has died and then it doesn't hurt anymore. The history is typically the same for someone with angina because they're both coronary artery disease. The big difference is, again, that the symptoms don't resolve with time or rest. So your typical symptoms are the same in a heart attack as they are for angina. They've got heaviness or squeezing in the chest that goes to the jaw, arms, or back. They have shortness of breath. They may get sweaty, feel nauseated, start vomiting, have a feeling of impending doom, and they may have some upper abdominal pain. Again, that's more common in diabetics and women, but it can be the presenting symptom in any patient. The exam, again, is often completely normal. Um, I see plenty of these patients routinely in the emergency department, and you find nothing on their exam. And again, they may be a little hypertensive because they're worked up and they may be sweaty. Treatment, do your initial stabilization, X, A, B, C, D, E, F, make them rest, decrease oxygen demand to the heart, and then MONA, M-O-N-A, treats all of these patients. M is morphine for pain control, O is oxygen to try to deliver any additional oxygen that we can, make sure that they're Red blood cells and hemoglobin are carrying all the oxygen it can. Nitroglycerin, which dilates the blood vessels of the heart. And if the, the vessel is completely blocked, 
it doesn't help particularly, but they may have what are called collateral vessels, smaller vessels that bypass that area, and if you can open those up, you decrease the pain, increase blood flow to the injured part of the heart. And then the most important drug you're going to give is aspirin, 324 milligrams orally. That's for low-dose aspirin, or you can give them one regular aspirin. They should, if at all possible, chew it and swallow it. That decreases their chance of death by 50%. Your doses for your other medications will vary somewhat. Nitroglycerin comes in 0.4 milligram tablets or sprays, and you'll give those every five minutes as needed for pain. Morphine, your range will probably be somewhere between 2 and 10 milligrams IV, and you'll discuss that with medical control. If the symptoms aren't getting better and you think they're having a heart attack, your disposition is immediate evacuation. What they need is an evaluation to decide whether they're having a type of heart attack called an ST elevation MI. It's a particular kind of heart attack where either giving medications to break down the clot or putting a catheter into the heart vessel and opening up the uh, blockage are the most important things you can do. In heart failure, the heart can't squeeze right, and particularly the left ventricle, the left side of the heart can't squeeze so you don't get good forward blood flow. This can be chronic or it can occur acutely with a heart attack and blood backs up into the lungs and into the venous side of the body. The history is typically of shortness of breath. If the blood is backing up into the right side of the body, uh, so it's left-sided heart failure, the fluid backs up into the lungs and then it backs up into the right side of the body, the patient can get swelling in their legs in their arms and their face and their abdomen if it's really bad. They typically have a past medical history of coronary artery disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, or congestive heart failure. On exam, they'll, uh, they'll be in respiratory distress because they've got fluid in the lungs. Their body's releasing a lot of epinephrine, adrenaline, to try to compensate for this. So their heart rate goes up, they get high blood pressure, they breathe very quickly, and because they have fluid in the lungs that's leaked into the alveoli, they can't get oxygen into their blood. So if you measure an oxygen saturation, it will be low. They'll be hypoxic. When you listen to the lungs, you'll hear crackling sounds, rails. And if it's really serious, they'll have pink frothy sputum, so pink bubbles, bubbly sputum coming out of their mouth. And if they have right-sided heart failure as well and fluid backing up into the body, they'll have leg swelling in both legs. Treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E, F. Put their legs down and their head up. The idea there is that you can pull some blood into the veins and the legs, and that decreases the pressure uh, on the heart and decreases pressure to put fluid into the lungs. Oxygen, and then lots and lots of nitroglycerin. What you're trying to do is get the fluid to redistribute out of the lungs and into the rest of the body. So 0 0.4 milligrams of nitroglycerin under the tongue every five minutes, sometimes every three minutes, and you keep doing it as long as their blood pressure is above 90 systolic. Talk to medical control. They may want you to go with a slightly higher blood pressure, but certainly that's what we aim for in, in the hospital is to try to get that blood pressure down enough that the fluid redistributes out of the lungs. Give them aspirin because this may be caused by a heart attack. Positive pressure ventilation, either with a bag valve mask or if you have it, a device called CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, that helps to push that fluid back out of the lungs. If the patient is total body fluid overloaded, that is they've got swelling and their weight is up, then medical control may have you give a medication called furosemide. It helps them pee off extra fluid. Uh, the problem is only 50% of people are total body fluid overloaded, and if you give furosemide to the people who aren't, they end up dehydrated. These patients will need immediate evacuation. They're very ill. In thoracic aortic dissection, the aorta, the big blood vessel that comes out of the top of the heart, forms an arch and then goes down through the abdomen and off of which all of your other blood vessels come. It's got three layers. All, the all your blood vessels have three layers. And the innermost layer, the intima, can rip off. And then blood flows between the middle layer and that inner layer. And it's called a false lumen. And if enough blood goes in there and enough of that inner layer tears off, it can completely block blood flow forward.
and what gets affected depends on where the tear starts, how far it extends, and how much the blood in that space between the intima and the media squishes down the true lumen of the blood vessel. The history is typically sudden severe chest pain radiating to the back, sharp tearing pain, but any chest pain with neurologic symptoms, numbness, tingling, weakness, particularly that affects one limb or one part of the body more than the other, is very concerning for a thoracic aortic dissection. On exam, typically the blood pressure will be up, and what you may find are unequal pulses. So unequal blood pressure on the two arms, or unequal pulses between the two arms, or it's normal between the two arms, but unequal between the arms and the legs, or it could be a completely normal exam. If you think this is what's going on, unless you've got the sharp, severe chest pain that's tearing, radiating to the back, or chest pain with neurologic symptoms, X, A, B, C, D, E, F, give them oxygen, give them IV fluids. Pain control with morphine helps to keep the blood pressure down enough that it doesn't make the tear worse and they need to be immediately evacuated. So discuss these patients with medical control early. Palpitations are when people can feel their heart beating in their chest and usually it's a sensation of them going fast because we don't usually feel it so people perceive it as fast even if they check their pulse and it's in the normal range it feels fast to them it's often normal but it can be a sign of serious disease so if you're talking to your patient it's important to find out has this happened before what medications illicit drugs or alcohol do they use or have they used recently when it happened did they check their pulse rate and what was it is it still happening did it seem regular or irregular when they checked their pulse rate? What was going on when it happened and how long did it last? And did they have any other symptoms? If they just felt the palpitations and felt anxious, that's probably a more benign cause. If they had chest pain or they passed out, then we, come, we become very concerned about bad underlying irregular heart rhythms. You need to do a cardiovascular exam, so you listen to the heart, and you don't need to become an expert in listening to heart sounds, but you need to know if they're there or not. So put your stethoscope over the chest in the area of the heart and see if you hear the heart beating. Listen to the lungs. You're looking for crackles, that sound of you rubbing your hair uh, between your fingers right by your ear, or ronchi, which is kind of a coarse, rumbling sort of noise. Uh, look at the neck and look and see if the veins are sticking out on the neck. On the extremities, look for swelling, feel for pulses, and make sure they're there and they're symmetric. And look at the skin, uh, skin for its color and whether or not it's moist, if they're sweating or not. So, on your exam, where do you feel pulses? On the neck, you can feel the carotid arteries. If you go to the midline over the Adam's apple or laryngeal prominence and slide your fingers slideways, there's a groove between that part of your airway and the muscles in your neck, the sternocleidomastoid, and you should feel the carotid arteries right in there. On the wrist, we most commonly feel the radial artery, which is on the thumb side, and we feel it, if you think about the anatomic position, on the anterior forearm, and you can see where the arrow is pointing here. Basically, you find the bone on the edge, slide in ever so slightly, and you'll feel the pulse. You can also feel an ulnar pulse on the other side of the arm. Typically, we don't feel the ulnar pulse. We just check the radio, but you can check both as part of a vascular exam. You have pulses in your groin, the femoral arteries. That's in the crease of the legs. And basically, you put your fingers, two fingers, into the crease there. Don't use your thumb whenever you're checking a pulse. Use your typically index and ring finger and the reason why is even though all your fingers have a pulse it's more prominent in your thumb so you can confuse your own pulse with the patient's pulse so by using those two fingers slide it into the crease and press down and you'll feel the pulse and the same is true of using just those two fingers when you check a radial pulse or any other pulse on the foot you've got two pulse points on the top of the foot um, just to the lateral side of the first medial bone, 
uh, the dorsalis pedis, and sometimes you have to slide your fingers around to, to feel those. And then behind the lump, the medial malleolus uh, on the inside of your foot where your ankle is, that's the end of your tibia, just below and behind that is something called the posterior tibial pulse. Now, the older you get, the less e easy it is to find these pulses uh, because the vessels start to stiffen up. So don't be surprised in someone over... 50 to 60 if you have trouble finding these pulses but if you can feel them on one side and not the other that's concerning normal pulse rates for an adult the typical range is given as 60 to 100 beats per minute honestly I'm comfortable with a heart rate down to 50 if the patient doesn't have symptoms so if you're ever asked for a test what's normal it's 60 to 100 but in reality, a patient who's asymptomatic, a heart rate down to 50 is not concerning. In a child, 80 to 130, and in infants, 120 to 160 beats per minute are normal. When you check a pulse, you want to feel the rhythm, and the rhythm is either going to be regular, so or irregular, and it can be regularly irregular. or irregularly irregular. And you telling me that as medical control, if you give me the symptoms, you say the patient had palpitations, they felt lightheaded or di and dizzy, I checked a pulse rate, it's somewhere between 110 and 140, and it's irregularly irregular. I have the diagnosis. They're in new onset atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. We don't need to discuss much of anything else uh, in terms of sorting out what's going on with the patient. So that information is very helpful. You also describe the quality of the pulse. Is it full or strong? So you feel it beating um, and it feels like a normal pulse and you should be able to compare to your own to feel that what normal is is it weak or what we call thready where you can barely feel it or is it bounding where you can basically look at the skin and see the pulse beating underneath it which would suggest what's called a hyperdynamic state where the heart's squeezing more than you would expect for normal we also use something called an EKG to do the cardiovascular exam and you may not have this available to you but in some in some ships this is something that's available and it's basically an oscilloscope that measures the electrical impulses of the heart on the skin and shows you on an oscilloscope what that electrical activity is and it tells you two important things it shows you the electrical flow through the pathways of the heart and if you get a 12 lead EKG it shows you the presence of what's called an ST elevation uh, myocardial infarct or a STEMI which is the kind of the kind of heart attack that does best with either the chemical clot busters or with cardiac catheterization where they go in and open the vessels mechanically. So a lot of these things control your heart's electrical activity. Your nervous system does through the parasympathetic side, something called the vagus nerve, which slows down your heart rate, and your sympathetic nervous system, which increases your heart rate, and it We'll often do that through your endocrine system, which releases epinephrine and norepinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline. These increase your heart rate. They increase how strongly the heart beats. They also cause the blood vessels to constrict some to increase blood pressure. And in fact, there's always some sympathetic tone from your adrenaline and your noradrenaline keeping your blood vessels constricted, which is why when someone gets neurogenic shock and they don't have that sympathetic tone anymore, they're not releasing the adrenaline and noradrenaline noradrenaline their blood vessels dilate and their blood pressure drops also the salts in your blood the electrolytes control conduction of electricity as well as the strength of contraction so this is the electrical system of your heart the SA node or sinoatrial node is in the right atrium and that's the master controller typically that initiates the electrical beat the electricity flows through the atrium to the AV node and the AV node sits in the division between the atria the upper parts of the heart and the ventricles the lower parts of the heart and so the rest of the heart that separation between the upper and lower part 
is electrically insulated. So the only place electricity can flow through is the AV node, and that's very important. The, the job of the AV node is to slow down electrical impulses so that the upper part of the heart squeezes, that sort of overpressurizes the lower part, the ventricles, and then the electricity goes in through the ventricles and causes them to squeeze. So it's a more effective and stronger squeeze. The electricity then flows down through the ventricles, through all those various bundles, the bundle of Hiss initially, and then the left bundle branch, the right bundle branch, and the bundle branch left breaks into the anterior and posterior fascicles, and they f it goes down the septum, the center part of the heart, and then the wiring goes up through the sides of the heart. And so contraction is this coordinated event. And it looks something like this. There's the EKG, there's the electrical flow. Starts up at the SA node, flows through the atria. It all concentrates at the AV node. That pauses it briefly. And then the electricity flows through and it causes the lower part of the heart to squeeze. And that gives you your most effective output. So heart cells are somewhat unique in that they can all fire on their own. They can all be excited by other cells. They can all conduct electricity, and they all contract. Some are specialized to do some things, like the SA and AV nodes, which are really set up to be the controlling pacemakers. But any heart cell could act as a pacemaker for the rest of the heart if need be. Sometimes that's very good. Sometimes that's very bad. The SA node will beat 60 to 100 times a minute, and that's your typical resting heart rate. This isn't an adult, your typical controlled rate. If the SA node stops working, the AV node will take over at 40 to 60 beats a minute. If the AV node is injured from a heart attack or toxins or whatever reason, the ventricles can take over at 20 to 40 beats per minute. So they're always waiting to do this. It's just that typically because the SA node is controlling it, the other two don't have to fire. Now we talked a little bit about the EKG. It's a summation of the heart's electrical activity, but it tells you nothing about the mechanical function. So you can have electrical activity in the heart not be squeezing. And that's a problem. It's pulseless electrical activity is how we describe it medically it's a real problem because if the heart's not squeezing, it doesn't matter what it's doing electrically, it's not circulating blood. So let's talk a little bit about the EKG. There's three lead and 12 lead EKGs. Um, you will most commonly have access to three lead. I'd love to see you have access to a 12 lead. That gives me much more information as medical control, but they're a lot more expensive, so three leads probably what you're going to have. The three leads are what are called bipolar leads, leads one, two, and three. They show the direction of electrical flow and the magnitude. So if the electricity is flowing negative to positive towards the measuring lead on the EKG, you'll see upward deflection from a baseline, and you'll see pictures of this. If it's away from the measuring lead, you'll see downward deflection. And we define specific leads based on where we place the electrode. So lead one, your positive electrode is on your left arm, and your negative electrode is on your right arm. The electricity is flowing from your negative to your positive. And lead two, your positive electrode is on the left leg, and your negative electrode is on the, your right arm. And lead three, you can see it. So to do routine three-lead EKG monitoring, we usually do this in lead two. This gives us our best view of the top part of the heart, the atria, where the sinoatrial node is, that controlling node and pacemaker, because we really want to see what that's doing. Um, and uh, we apply our electrodes. They come pre-gelled. You want to shave the hair off in the area where you're going to put them on if they're very hairy. If they're not really hairy, you can clean the skin with alcohol. If you already shaved it, don't use the alcohol. They won't like you very much. Attach the EKG cables to the electrodes and then put the electrodes onto the body. Some people put the electrodes on first and then snap the EKGs on the EKG cables on. I think that puts a lot of pressure on the patient is uncomfortable. And then turn your EKG monitor on and obtain a baseline tracing of the uh, of the electrical activity. If you're not getting a good 
image, you're not getting a good EKG, check your cable, make sure it's attached, make sure you didn't put the electrodes on to a lot of hair so there's not good skin contact, make sure your electrodes are actually where they should be. The further out they are on the body, so the further out they are on the arms, the, the more precise the electrical tracing, but the more interference there is, so the, the harder it can be to read the EKG. So if you're having a lot of junk and movement around on the baseline and it's not nice and flat, then you want to move your electrodes closer to their core, onto their chest perhaps. And if they're diaphoretic or sweating, the electrodes are just going to fall right off. So, again, deflection above the baseline is a positive current. Deflection below the baseline is a negative current. EKGs are printed out on graph paper. The graph paper moves. There's a stylus that records the time and the voltage. And the time is on the horizontal graph. The amplitude or voltage is on the vertical axis. The standard speed is 25 millimeters per second. Each of those little boxes is one millimeter so you can do the math and figure out that one millimeter is 0 0.04 seconds so each of those little box boxes there horizontally is 0 0.04 seconds and each large square which is five millimeters is 0.2 seconds one-fifth of a second and then the reference pulse uh, you can see there's an amplitude height as well the 10 millimeters is 1 millivolt, so each box up in amplitude is 0 0.1 millivolts of electricity. That's less important than the time axis because you're really going to care about time uh, in terms of looking at your EKG. So in a normal EKG tracing, you have some things that you see. You see a P wave, a QRS complex, a T wave, a PR interval, a QT interval, an ST segment, and the baseline. So looking at this EKG here, the flat line coming in and going out of that complex, that's the baseline. That first upward deflection, that's the P wave. There's then another flat line, preferably return to baseline, although it doesn't always happen. And then sometimes there is a downward deflection, and that's called the Q. That's followed by an upward deflection, called the R wave, and another downward deflection from the baseline called the S wave. And so that's the QRS complex. Between the S wave and the next upward deflection is the ST segment. And then that upward hump is called the T wave. And this is what you typically see on an EKG. This is the PQRST complex. So that P wave is your first upward deflection. It ends at the point where the wave returns to the baseline, and that's the atria depolarizing and, and basically squeezing if it's doing the mechanical correlation to the uh, electrical activity. It's rounded. It comes before the QRS complex. The QRS complex is your Q, your R, and your S. Q is the first downward deflection after the P wave. It may not be present. Oftentimes you won't have a Q wave and that's fine. And if the Q wave is really big, that's a sign of a previous heart attack. R is the first upward deflection after the P wave. And that's generally your most prominent feature. Uh, that's your ventricular depolarization. S is your first downward deflection after the R wave. Again, that may or may not be present. And it ends where the last wave begins to flatten out, and it can be at, above, or below the baseline. But once the S starts to flatten, that's the end of the QRS complex. Normally, it's skinny and sharply pointed and should be less than three boxes wide from where it, the small boxes from where it first starts till it flattens out. That's less than 0 0.12 seconds, and that's your ventricular depolarization. There's an ST segment, and that's between where the S starts flattening out and the beginning of the T wave. That's the early repolarization of the ventricles. And that is, on a 12 lead, what we look at to look for evidence of a heart attack. It goes up, gets elevated above the baseline in a heart attack. You can't necessarily tell if that has any meaning in a 3 lead EKG,
because the three lead EKGs aren't calibrated necessarily to look at that relative to the baseline. But in 12 lead EKGs, that's what we're really looking for. If it gets depressed downward, that's a sign of inadequate blood flow or angina. And again, the elevation is a sign of no blood flow or a heart attack. And we call that an ST elevation myocardial infarct. The T wave is the ventricular cells repolarizing, and it's that first upward deflection after the QRS complex. If they're flipped or upside down, they're a sign of ischemia to the heart, so angina or a non-ST segment elevation MI where they're having a heart attack, but it's not the type that does well with catheterization or thrombolytics. Usually it's because of diffuse disease, not just one area that's affected. So when you look at an EKG, you need to answer five questions. Is the patient sick? And that's obviously not something you're going to see on the EKG. That's something you're going to see from the patient. What's the heart rate? Do the QR co QRS complexes look normal and are they regular? Can you see P waves and are the P waves related to QRS complexes? So is the patient sick? You've got to figure it out. What are their vital signs? What do they look like in front of you? Are they pale? Are they diaphoretic? Do they have red flag findings, either symptoms or signs that make you very concerned? They're sick. And no matter what the EKG tells you, they're still sick. So a normal EKG doesn't help you by saying they're not sick. An abnormal EKG is useful because it may explain why they're so sick. If they're not sick at all and you have an abnormal EKG, well, you need to talk to medical control because it may be what we call true, true, and unrelated. They're not sick, they have an, un an abnormal EKG, and there's no relationship between those two things. Analyze your rate. If the ventricular rate's below 60, it's bradycardia. If it's above 100, it's tachycardia. And the ventricular rate is what we see on the QRS complexes. That gives us our ventricular rate. So how do we figure this out? You need to remember these numbers. Remember that each of those larger boxes is a fifth of a second. And so if we draw a line where QRS complexes is, is on one of those larger box lines, so where that red line is, if the QRS comp next QRS complex were on the next big line, the rate would be 300. If it were on the line after that, it would be 150. If it were on the line after that, it would be 100. The line after that would be 75. The line after that would be 60. And the line after that would be 50. So you have to remember 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. And in this case, you look at this, and there are 1, 2, 3, 4, almost five lines between the two, so the rate is somewhere between 60 and 75, closer to 60. Step three is to look at the QRS. Is it regular? And what's the width? We talked about normal being less than 0 0.12 seconds, or three of the small boxes. Between 0 0.1 seconds, or two and a half boxes, and 0 0.12 seconds, we call it a borderline uh, ventricular conduction delay and so that's a slightly abnormal thing. Now if you look at this 12 lead EKG here you can see quite a bit of information on it um, and it will tell you your QRS duration but on a 3 lead EKG it won't. You have to actually measure out from the beginning of the Q wave to the flattening of the S wave and figure out is it less than three small boxes or is it greater than three small boxes. These are abnormal looking QRS complexes. So you can see compared to these other ones, these are narrow, they're skinny, they're less than 0 0.12 seconds, these are wide, and they are almost 0.2 seconds wide, if not slightly larger. As part of looking at your QRS, determine if they're regular. And again, they can be regular, regularly irregular or irregularly irregular just like the pulse. Not a shock, it's that electrical activity that's corresponding to their mechanical pulse. So the technique is to compare the R to R distance from the left to the right. You find your shortest R to R and you compare it to your longest R to R. So R to R is the distance between one R wave and the next R wave. So you have to measure the distance, and you can measure it in millimeters or in time. 
but ultimately if the difference between the shortest R to R and the longest R to R is greater than 0.16 seconds or four small boxes we call that rhythm irregular and you may not be able to feel that on the pulse that's fairly subtle um, 0 0.1 second difference between the shortest and the longest isn't necessarily something that's going to be easy to detect but you can calculate it out and measure it out on the EKG next you want to look at P waves are there P waves so P waves are that first upward deflection after the last QRST complex so if we look at lead 2 which is the second lead down on the left side of this EKG you see a small bump right before the QRS complex that's a P wave are they regular well they certainly look like they're occurring regularly on this EKG and is there one P wave for each QRS <clears throat> you're not going to do necessarily the analysis to tell me what the irregular rhythm is if that's not the case but that's important information for you to be able to give to medical control so you see a P wave before each QRS there are no QRS's without P waves lots of things can cause a regular heartbeat the big ones we worry about are heart attack and problems with the salts in the blood or acids and bases but drug toxicity electrical injury hypothermia all sorts of other things can cause this as well so you need to consider this in your differential diagnosis if you're trying to figure out what's going on with a patient and you find that they have an irregular heartbeat you need to think well geez what else is going on that's causing this there are six rhythms you need to be able to identify and possibly a seventh as well so I'll teach them all to you normal sinus rhythm or NSR sinus bradycardia or SB sinus tachycardia or ST asystole ventricular tachycardia VT or VTAC ventricular fibrillation VF or VFib and atrial fibrillation is potentially a useful one to know so we'll talk about it again you're treating the patient not the monitor it doesn't matter what the cardiac monitor shows if the patient doesn't look at all like what you would expect once you get your tracing talk to medical control if the patient's alive if they're not alive just start CPR and if you want to know more than that take an ACLS class an advanced cardiac life support class and you'll get all sorts of detail about how to take care of these patients so this is a normal sinus rhythm you've got a P wave followed by a QRS every P wave has a QRS the QRS's are narrow and the rate is 62 beats a minute so between 60 and 100 this is what you want to see on your patient this is a 12 lead EKG again typically you would get a 3 lead which is only going to show you that lead 2 and you run it for 6 seconds to get your standard strip in sinus bradycardia the pacemaker at the SA node is slow but the electricity is following the normal pathways so it's a sinus rhythm P QRS P QRS less than 60 beats a minute it may mean absolutely nothing so it depends on whether the patient's having symptoms at all that would make you think about a slow heart rate at the management will depend on whether or not the patient's ill so that's a sinus bradycardia if you march that out the rate is just over 50 so 300 150 175 60 and right there uh, probably around 52 54 beats a minute but you see a P followed by a QRS and a T then a P followed by a QRS and a T in sinus tachycardia you've got a fast pacemaker at the SA node the electricity follows the normal pathway the EKG shows a sinus rhythm P QRS T P QRS T greater than 100 beats a minute the clinical significance will depend on the patient sinus tachycardia is a reaction to something your body is increasing your heart rate for a reason so you're not so worried about the sinus tachycardia itself you're really worried about what's causing it so your treatment will depend on what's causing that sinus tachycardia so here P Q R S T P Q R S T. you look at your rate 300 150 so that's pretty fast and so something's going on that's getting you concerned about this in atrial fibrillation that automaticity thing kicks in so if the you have high blood pressure and your atrial cells get straight your atria are stretched and the cells are stretched they become irritable they start firing randomly on their own and they fire really fast two to three hundred beats a minute the AV node keeps all that electricity from shooting down to the ventricles so it, it slows them down
and only a few get through to fire the ventricle, but still that can be 150 to 180 of them every minute. And because they're getting through rather randomly depending on when they hit, it's an irregularly irregular heartbeat. If it's new onset, the rate tends to be fast. These patients may pay it, pass out. They lose forward flow from the atria squeezing, so they lose about 10 to 15 percent of their forward cardiac output. And if it goes on for more than a few days, they can make clots in the left atrium because it's just sitting there quivering. And then those clots can be pushed through and cause strokes or block off blood vessels in other parts of the body. Chronic patients on atrial fibrillation, they're often on blood thinners, so they can get complications from all the blood thinners. And they can decompensate if they get sick, their atrial fibrillation can get much worse. So here you've got an irregularly irregular rhythm. You've got no P waves because the SA node isn't working. The atria are just firing randomly, so there's no P waves at all. If you look at that first R to R interval, you rate 300 and somewhere above 150, rate of about 180. If you look at that second R to R interval on in the bottom, 300, 150, close to 100. So huge variation in the rate uh, between each beat. And you can just look at this rhythm strip and see how irregular looking it is. In ventricular tachycardia, the ventricles also can be automatic, and so they begin to beat fast. If it's to rescue you because your SA node or your AV node has failed, it'll be a slow rate, 20 to 40 maybe. But if something's irritating them, they'll fire faster than the SA node, greater than 100 beats per minute, usually from ischemia or problems with the salts in the blood. And the problem is, is that when the ventricles start squeezing this fast, they don't have time to refill, so they're not moving blood forward, so the patient goes into shock. So here's ventricular tachycardia on the EKG. It's a wide QRS. There's no P waves at all, and it's fast. If you do an R to R on this, your rate is somewhere close to 200, between 150 and 300 there. It's, it's fast. So the treatment, they can either be in cardiac arrest, in which case it's just CPR and defibrillation, standard cardiac arrest management. But if they're not in cardiac arrest, they're tachycardic, you put on the EKG, they're in ventricular tachycardia, talk to medical control. What you can do, your options are fairly limited, but you do have some medicines that may be able to slow them down a little bit and try to sort out what's going on. They will clearly need to be evacuated. In ventricular fibrillation, just like in atrial fibrillation, instead of coordinated fast squeezing of the ventricle cells, they fire randomly on their own. So the heart basically sits and quivers. There's no forward blood flow at all. The EKG is chaotic. It's irregularly irregular. It's wide complex. There is no blood flow. These patients are in cardiac arrest. So you can see this is sort of this random, irregularly shaped, wide complex this patient will have no pulse. This patient will be in cardiac arrest. You'll be using the AED. You might see this on your three-lead monitor if you also put the three-lead on during cardiac arrest, or more likely, you're taking care of a patient who's having a heart attack, they're having chest pain, you put them on the three-lead monitor, they suddenly go into cardiac arrest, you look at the monitor, and this is what you see. Treatment for it is CPR and defibrillation, and hopefully you get them back. In asystole, you have no electrical activity at all. And remember, you can have electrical activity without mechanical activity, but you can't have it the other way around. If there's no electrical activity, there is definitely no mechanical activity happening. The EKG is a flat line. These patients are in cardiac arrest. And if you see this, this heart is not going to get better. This is felt to be more a sign of death than a rhythm to be resuscitated. We'll still start to resuscitate them, but you talk to medical control, say, I've got asystole, it's persistently asystole. These patients are not going to survive. When you defibrillate someone, what you're actually doing is you're putting the heart briefly into asystole with hopes that the SA node or the AV node will take over as a pacemaker and it'll come back to a regular rhythm. In this case, the patient is already in asystole, and we know that the SA node and the AV node are not working. So this is what it looks like, flat line on the EKG, flip through at least 
th two leads, preferably three, so you can look at the heart from different angles and make sure that electrically you're seeing asystole all the way through. Treatment is CPR. You'll put on an AED. It will tell you that a shock is not advised, and you'll continue to do CPR. Now, it is unrealistic that you would continue CPR for hours and hours and hours. We know from lots of really good studies that people who don't get a pulse back after 20 minutes don't get a pulse back. And if they do, they don't survive discharge from the hospital neurologically intact, with some very, very rare exceptions. You can't do CPR forever. It is incredibly dangerous and an incredible waste of resources to transport a dead body by helicopter just to give it CPR so that they can get to a hospital and be told that the patient's dead. So after 20 minutes of resuscitation, using a CPR, doing CPR and using an AED, talk to medical control about terminating resuscitation. If you have not had return of spontaneous circulation, a pulse back at any point during your resuscitation, there is no point in continuing resuscitation. That person is dead. As I said, my preference, if I'm your medical control, is that you have 12 lead EKG available. Chances are good that you won't. Um, it gives me far more information than a 3 lead EKG ever would. You can describe what you see to me. You can read the interpretation of it, and I can really get a good idea of what's going on electrically with a patient's heart. But if you get do have 12 lead EKG monitoring, it's great because you're looking at the heart from 12 directions, and you're looking mostly for damage, that ST elevation MI in the patient with chest pain. It can also show me some changes, the flip T waves, the depressed ST segments that would suggest a non-ST elevation MI, but still ischemia of the heart. So if you have it, great. Practice putting them on. If you don't have them, well, that's the most likely scenario. And this is how you put the 12 lead on. And this is just a very brief description of it. But um, that's the idea. You're putting on six chest leads, four limb leads. You get 12 pictures of the heart. And this is what it looks like. Very handy. This is a pre-hospital style 12 lead EKG. Uh, these are the kind of monitors that would be available to you if they were going to be available typically. Please complete any associated knowledge reviews, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your professor or instructor. Thank you very much.